July is peak summer vibes. However, it also is the time when things can go completely sideways. So in today's video, I'm going to give you five expert tips that are completely science backed by peer review papers on how to avoid issues way before they strike. And these are issues that are heavily detrimental. We're talking blossom and rot, itsy bitsy garlic or onion disease, you name it. So let's get into it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ashley and I have 15 years experience in the world of agriculture and a bachelor's of science in soil science. And with that being said, I like to take said science and apply it to the garden in a fun way because it's just gardening. I don't take it that seriously, but I'm a nerd. So there's that. So if you do enjoy more science-based gardening content, plant science, soil science world, then be heard be sure to hit that subscribe button. I always forget to ask you to do this, but it helps enormously if you click that subscribe button. And to say thank you for hitting that subscribe button, here is a very cute video of my dog, Kane, being cute as always. Okay, number one is actually spooning your onions. That's right, folks. Get into your garden and play big spoon, not little spoon, because they're the little spoon. They're the one that needs to be cared for in this case. Joking aside, spooning is exactly what it sounds like. It is literally going into the onion's habitat, removing any weeds around said onion, and then actually digging down until you hit the bulb. We are looking for a bulb that is a little smaller than a loony, 25 cent-ish size. And if that bulb is at that size, what you wanna do is you wanna clear away the soil around said bulb. Now this doesn't have to be particularly sophisticated. It can be with your finger. It can obviously be with a spoon itself. I personally enjoy fingering them. Um, and so all you wanna do is remove some of that soil away, which is going to remove some of the pressure. There's a study done in 2022 that not only relieving the pressure on the bulb, but exposing the bulb to air air and the sunlight resulted in 18 to 20% larger bulbs. The key with that study was simply to remove the pressure and the soil away from the bulb, but not to dig down to the roots. So you only want to go about halfway down the bulb and that is it. We don't want to hit those roots because that would be bad if we did that. This next one is more of a reminder than anything, and that is to trellis or steak, depending on what you desire or what you enjoy. Now, the reason for this is because in 2020, there was a study done by Agriculture and Natural Resources that showed the actual process of giving plants such as peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, squash, physical structure and or support resulted in 15 to 20 percent higher yields. The reason for this actually came down to a few factors but first off it obviously is not going to snap if it's properly supported. Secondly you can then prune accordingly and make sure that there's enough airflow which reduces disease as well as it gives you a better opportunity to visually see if there is any pests or disease on the plants. That one sounds basic and that's because it is. It is mostly a reminder to do it because it's been pouring rain here nonstop and lots of tornadoes, shockingly enough. And uh, so these bad boys were not trellised for a very long time and you can, it shows. It shows, that's all I have to say, it shows. Next one is actually having a continual source of water. So for my tomato bed specifically, I have a dripper system, but this continual source of water doesn't apply to just tomatoes. It applies to peppers, cucumbers, your flowers, you name it. If the plant does not have regular consistent watering or access to a continual water supply, you will end up with flower drop. Your flowers will just simply pop off as though they were never there, and or you'll end up with burr, aka blossom and rut. The reason for this is because in 2019, a meta-analysis was done and it showed that a plant that did not have access to continual water sources actually had a failure in transport of calcium. And this failure in transport of calcium is what resulted in the blossom end rot. Now I've done a whole video on blossom end rot to determine if it's a calcium issue or if it's something else. So go check that out if you are unsure, but I would say 99.999% of the time it is going to be lack of water. And so having something like this, 
which was super easy to do. I have a video on it. Trust me, if I can do it, you can do it. And I mean that wholeheartedly because I am not good at this sort of stuff at all. And just to kind of like really drive home the importance of this, that 2019 meta-analysis published in Frontiers actually showed that even three days of drought conditions, three days, meaning just three days with slightly restricted water resulted in a failure in the calcium transport mechanisms, meaning it does not take much for these guys to suffer blossom and rot with the absence of water. And it's raining again. I haven't been able to film in like literal freaking weeks. I'm not even like, I'm not over exaggerating um, because I have a full-time job. So when it's not raining during the day, I'm working. Uh, so I am so low on content, it's not even funny. Okay, this next one is definitely an expert tip and one I struggle with enormously, and that is selective removal of fruits and flowers. Now, here's the thing. Eggplants, tomatoes, cucumbers can and will overproduce their flowers. This overproduction is because they expect to lose flowers. Now, in a controlled environment like the garden where we're trellising and watering nicely and fertilizing, the loss of flowers isn't really a thing. And so this, by all means, great adaptation for the wild is not the greatest when they're domesticated and therefore it can result in smaller, less tasty fruit. Now, this means that you need to be picky on which tomatoes or plants make it through. And I know this is, this is hard. This is so hard to do, but here's the thing. 2015, a meta-analysis was done specific to tomatoes and it did show a 20 to 35% increase in the tomato volume that was produced. And it also drastically dropped the potential for burr which is blossom and rot again. So it's a tough one. I struggle with it. I personally cannot do it to save my life, but it's something to consider. And the time when I am able to do it and it doesn't stress me out is actually when we're at the end of the season, towards the end of August, I will top and then remove any flowers that don't seem to be doing much. And that does help. It does help and it helps get what is on the plant through and producing properly. And it's really starting to rain. Okay, so this next one is another odd one that I've never really heard mentioned on the internet. And that is heat stress causing a decrease in pollinators. Now this decrease in pollinators, particularly in the warm months of July, is not a good thing. It's actually a very bad thing because that is when a majority of stuff is flowering. So whether it's an enclosed flower, like a tomato that requires mechanical manipulation of a bumblebee buzzing around it, or if it's a squash where we actually need the, the physical pollinator to move from flower to flower to flower to plant to plant to plant, to plant if the temperature gets above that 30 degrees Celsius mark, pollinators slow down drastically. And this was actually shown in a paper in 2019, published in Ecology Letters. Now to further amplify the stress on these poor buggers is that when the temperature gets above that mark, once again, tomatoes and squash actually fail to germinate or produce pollen. So that is another big problem. So the way to counteract the reduction in pollen formation and the reduction in pollinators hanging out, there are a couple things you can do. Number one is going to be shade cloth. This is relatively easy to stall, install in theory, but if you don't have like any sort of structure, it can be a little bit difficult. So you may need to just consider a piece of cardboard or a way to kind of just shade it this way rather than over top and that will help enormously. The other thing is actually shallow dishes of water and there's very specific feeders I guess you could say for bumblebees and this will help encourage them because there is a water source nearby and so that can be helpful. This is important. It'll produce cacti. Cacti is it that is all. So like I said, take these expert tips to your garden and watch how these little small adjustments can make a major impact on your yields. Geek Crew, what are your absolute must-dos in July? I would love to hear what they are and I will talk to you guys next time.